Can we thank Amy? I love that we get to do this together. Uh, my name is Michael. If we haven't met, I'm the South Hill lead pastor. I'm excited that you're here with us this morning. I think it's not officially fall, but it feels like fall. So I'm excited. I know most of you are excited as well with the rain, right? No? Okay. I lost. That's when I lost them. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're going to continue with the series together. And I'm excited about this series. Uh, it has a couple of different meanings. For one, we are together uh, as a body here on the South Hill. We are family. We're together. But we're also together as Jesus' body, his church, all the churches and uh, disciples of Jesus who love, follow, and serve Jesus, we're together with them as one body. And I love that we get to do this life together. Uh, this church is also a part of a network of churches. Uh, Real Life Northside launched a little over nine years ago, I believe, and we got launched out of them uh, last February. And so we've been working together this last year and a half trying to advance the kingdom of God, um, reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. Uh, we do that by multiplying disciples and churches in real relationship. And so we're part of that. We were born out of that desire to multiply disciples and churches. And today is exciting as well because we um, have launched a preview service in Cheney for the first time. So they're meeting right now, which is really exciting. Uh, for us, because we um, are not just celebrating what God's doing over there, we're actually partnering with God, and we're actually sending some of our people. Some of our best leaders are answering the call to go make disciples out in Cheney, and so they're out there this morning. So I love that we get to be a part of uh, a family that's doing this together in our region. This series, Together, really the heartbeat is we want to, um, we want to make sure we're aligned and unified on the things that really matter. There's so many things that, that um, don't matter, really, that end up tearing churches apart, end up breaking relationships. One of the biggest reasons for church splits and all that stuff, as ridiculous as it sounds, is the color of the carpet. It's, it's silly. Um, people go, hey, I want brown. Well, I want white. Well, then we're leaving because we can't deal with this. You know, or crosses, crosses being displayed either on the, the, the wall behind us or not on the wall behind us. Churches split over things like that. And so we want to have a conversation about, man, what are we actually together on? Because there's more that actually unites us and, and brings us together than should separate us. And so we started this whole conversation a couple weeks ago looking at what it means to be mature in the faith. Our primary goal is not just to be saved, not just to say yes to Jesus, but actually to grow into maturity in Jesus, in our faith. And so we looked at different ways of measuring. A lot of times we measure maturity based on age. Well, I'm this many years old, so I'm that mature. Or years in church, or how much we know of the Bible. And all those things are great, but we see that God redefined it. Jesus himself redefines the, the measure of maturity, and he defined it as love. Love is the measure of maturity. Jesus was asked by some of the religious leaders, he said, what's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? They asked for one, he gave them two. He said, love God and love people with everything you got. Everything hinges on that right there. Love is the measure of our maturity. And then last week, we got to unpack some of the uh, one of the tools we use to help us grow in our maturity, we call it the spiritual wheel, and um, it'll be on the screen, I believe, behind me. And again, it's just this, this tool that helps us see that there is a step and a growth in our maturity in Jesus. So at some point, we all were far from God. We didn't know him, we didn't love him, we didn't follow him. And so spiritually, we were dead. And then at some point, God stirred up in our heart a need for a savior. There's these words that come out, I need a savior, with the truth of, man, God created us relationship with him and with each other, and because of my sin, my actions, my disobedience to God, I'm separated from relationship with him. Man, I need a savior. And so we have this moment of saying yes to Jesus, starting to follow him. We become a new creation. We're born again. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. You will not enter into heaven. And so we become uh, believers we are baptized, we are now little cute baby followers of Jesus. We don't know everything. So what we do is we grow, 
We get connected with people. We start learning what it looks like to follow Jesus. And as we grow, our love increases to the point where we become, uh, we want to become children because God stirs up in us. I need connection. I need others. And so we start building relationships with each other. And then as we grow and mature in our faith and our love starts to increase even more, we go, hey, I need to start using these gifts, these talents, these abilities to start serving others. So it's not so focused on me and what I need, but what others need. So we become young adults in our faith journey. And we start serving like crazy. And then we realize, I can only do so much. I can only serve so many hours. What I need to do is I need to be more intentional. And so I need to uh, raise up people who can do what I do. And so then you become a spiritual parent as you start reproducing what God is doing in you and those around you. And so that's kind of a journey. We kind of identified where we were at and walked through that last week. And so if you haven't, if you weren't here the last two weeks, you can check them out online on YouTube. Uh, Today, we're going to kind of continue because we heard a lot of people go, yep, okay, I agree with you. Love is the measure. Great. Okay, I see the spiritual wheel. I can identify where I'm at. So I know what my next step is. You know, it's either to get in a group or start serving, whatever. But how do we do that? What does it actually look like? So today, we're going to unpack what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus And uh, there's this thing where sometimes we refer to ourselves as Christians, but you know that Jesus never called Christians. He never invited someone to be a Christian. He didn't. That word didn't come along till well after Jesus was gone. He actually called people to be disciples of Jesus. And so we're going to, the bottom line for today, if you leave with nothing else, remember this, a disciple of Jesus pursues Jesus. A disciple of Jesus pursues Jesus. And this tension of being a, a Christian versus being a disciple is, uh, is kind of the context for the, the, the story we're going to look at. We're going to be in John chapter 1 if you want to turn there in your Bible or Bible app. We'll get there in a moment. But this idea of being a disciple, uh, back in those days in the Jewish culture, they had uh, rabbis, teachers, and people would follow them. They would be disciples of that rabbi. They would go wherever that person went. They would stay with them. So wherever they slept, they slept. Whatever they ate, they ate. Whatever they did, the disciple did as as well. They were like in their back pocket the whole time, learning, growing, um, and and reproducing what the, the rabbi, the teacher was doing. And so that's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who's actively and engaged in following or pursuing someone. And so we're saying a disciple of Jesus pursues Jesus. And I want to share just kind of a question. Like, I think so many times in our lives, we feel like we're just responding or reacting. Like, things are happening to us. Life is happening to us. Things are being done to us. Um, Man, like, life is rolling over us. And I think sometimes our relationship with Jesus feels that same way. It's, we just react to it. We uh, forget that we're followers of Jesus until we hit a roadblock. And then we go, oh, God. I need you. Please fix this, 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 and this. Amen. And then things get better, and we go, okay, cool. And then we forget God again. We don't uh, actually spend time doing it because our lives are so built on being reactionary. And I want to share with you that you and I are, we're ridiculously in charge. We're more in charge of our thoughts, our actions, our responses than we think we are. We're ridiculously in charge. So what would happen if you were in charge of your connection with Jesus, your intimacy with Jesus, what would happen? Would would your relationship look different? Would it feel different? I I think there's this line that each of us have to to cross that that goes from uh, it being just an abstract thought of like agreeing with, with God, agreeing that we need a Savior, and actually choosing to step into that and choosing to to follow the Savior choosing to to follow him, to to make him the the focus, the primary center of our life. There's this decision that you and I have to make. I can't preach a message or or have someone give you an encouraging speech or whatever, and you're going to go, yep, I agree with everything. But none of us, I can't make you actually respond and take your next steps. That's a decision you have to come to. You have to either say yes and respond with obedience to Jesus or not. And I think for, for us, I think we want to be a people that know Jesus. We want to know his voice. We want to know the power of his presence. We want to experience life as he has called us to experience life. It says in John 10, 10, he came to give us a full life, a life that's full of him, connected with him. And to do that, we need to make him the center of our lives. And so as we look at this, 
this uh, story in John 1, we uh, see that there's this guy named John the Baptist. Uh, he was somebody who baptized people in the river, and his name was John. They were real creative when they named him John the Baptist. And so there's this guy who's kind of radical. He's living out in the wilderness. He eats like bugs, like locusts and honey. And he's just kind of a radical dude. And he's out there doing God's work, baptizing people in the river, telling them to repent, which means turn from living your self-led lives and follow God. Do what God says, not what you want to do. Do what God says. And so he's telling these people that. And these religious people, the Pharisees, come out and go, hey, who are you? What are you about? Are you one of the prophets that we heard about? Maybe Elijah coming back? Are you the Messiah, the, the promised uh, king who would come and make everything right? And John said, I'm not. I'm not that person. I'm, I'm merely preparing the way for that guy. And he's, he is coming and he is, he is here. And so that's when we, we pick it up. And so John has his disciples with him, people who are following John the Baptist, learning from him, uh, trying to be uh, more like him as he's trying to follow God. And so we catch up with them in verse 35 of chapter one, it says this, the following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following and said, what do you, what do you want? He asked them, they replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? So Jesus said, come and see. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the men who heard John said what John said about and followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Our relationship with God has to be the central relationship in all of our lives. And just like any other relationship, it takes time, it takes investment on our part. We need to put um, energy and effort into our relationship. Now the disciples, they leave what they were doing. They left who they were with and they followed Jesus so closely that he stops and pauses and goes, hey, what, what, do, you, what do you want? And it wasn't an accusatory like, hey, what's your problem? Get out of my personal space, what do you want? You know, it's not like me walking down the street if someone got real close to me I, I wouldn't do that. I would probably scream and run and hide. But like he just goes, hey, what, what, what do you want? And they go, where are you at? Their desire was to be with him. And so he said, come and see. And so um, they're not trying to follow him in a distance, right? They want to be right next to him. Because if that is, if he is who he says he is, they want to be as close to him as possible. And that's what real pursuit looks like. These disciples are a model of what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus who pursues Jesus. They are constantly chasing after him, following him, asking him where he is going to be. For you and I, we probably need to create some new rhythms in our lives and, and to be able to chase after Jesus. So a disciple of Jesus pursues Jesus. A disciple of Jesus pursues Jesus. And part of this pursuit is personal. Pursuing is personal. You and I have to come to a personal revelation of who God is, who Jesus is. Again, it's like that you and I each have to make a personal uh, a statement or a, an agreement with who God is. It can't be, well, my mom's a follower of Jesus, so I guess I'm in too because I'm, I'm her son. No, it has to be a personal decision that you make, that you make. Uh, these men, when John said, look, there is the Lamb of God, they had to make a personal decision to either stay with John or follow Jesus. They decided to make that decision themselves and to follow Jesus. They left what they knew they, they left what had gotten them to this point in life, the teaching that John was doing, and they followed after Jesus. So to be a, a disciple of Jesus who uh, pursues Jesus, we need to understand that pursuing him is personal. It's also uh, pursuing his proximity. It's actually being close to him. As they were walking, they were following Jesus so close behind, he asked them, what do you want? Do you know how close you have to be to <laughs> to have somebody like turn around and ask you that, you've got to be really close, like really close in their personal space for them to go, hey, what, 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 are, you, what are you after? What are you, what are you looking for? What do you want? That's how close we need to be to Jesus. And so whatever you need to do to get to Jesus, whatever it takes, do that. 
Move obstacles, change your rhythms, sacrifice where you need to sacrifice, make priorities uh, of the things that need to be important. A question I often ask myself is, what would Jesus say your priority was? What would Jesus say about your pursuit of him? Would he say, man, you're doing great, or I only see him when he needs something. You know, what is, what is your pursuit, your proximity to Jesus look like? For me, I have to alter my plans. I have to go to where Jesus is. I don't ask him to get on board with what I'm doing. I don't, um, like these disciples, they didn't say, oh, there's the Lamb of God, got it. Hey, Jesus, we want to keep doing what we're doing. Can you just come and follow us? Can you just bless what I'm doing? No, they actually had to leave and follow who Jesus was. And I think for some of us, uh, and I know from my life and times, that's where I get most spun out in this whole faith journey, this growth of my faith, is I get really frustrated. I get really frustrated that my plans aren't working, that my things are falling apart, that God doesn't seem to be there. And I realize it's probably because my pursuit is off. I'm not actually pursuing Jesus to be with him. I'm only going to him when I need something. I'm just trying to prime that, that blessing pump so that he will bless my life and then I'll go on doing what I want to do. God, hey, it's not, you know, I really want to keep doing this like a bolt-on, an add-on. And Jesus isn't an add-on to our life. He is either our life or not our life. And so I change my plans. Jesus says it like this. He says, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. You must take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will find it. Jesus, if he is the king, if he is the master, the savior, if he is who he says he is and who John declares, look, there's the lamb of God, the chosen one of God, the savior of the world. If that's truly who he is, man, it's humbling for me. It's humbling for you. And, and, and I have to come to this place of, man, if you are who you say you are, then man, my only my only reaction can be to follow you because knowing that your ways, your perspective, your pursuits, your thoughts, your plans for my life, for the lives of those people around me are far greater than mine. They have to be. If you're king and I'm just a follower, just a servant, man, your ways are way better than I am. And so I have to come on board with you. I can't stay where I'm at and you can't stay where you're at and follow Jesus if Jesus is going that way. It's like these, these disciples had to make a decision. I can't stay with John and follow Jesus. Now, John wasn't a bad guy. He was doing God's work, right? He was baptizing people like crazy. He was telling people about God, like, hey, you need to follow God. He was doing amazing things, but he wasn't the savior of the world. He was merely pointing and preparing the way for the savior. And so you and I, we need to leave Whatever we, we know, what we think is best for our lives, and we need to follow Jesus because we can't do both. Richie last week was sharing, you can either choose good or you can choose God. Do you want to live a good life or do you want to live the life that God has called you to? And honestly, the life that he's called you to is probably a lot more challenging, maybe a little bit more difficult than a good life. It's, and that's tough. I think, you know, for us, God is calling us to follow after him, to pursue him. If, we're, if we are disciples of Jesus, we need to pursue Jesus, which means some of us need to leave behind some things. We need to leave behind some things that we thought were good, and maybe they are good, but we need to leave them behind to follow what's best, which is Jesus. And some of those things, again, maybe, what, maybe, maybe walking away from really means reprioritizing your life. Some of the things that come to mind are kids' sports. Some of, of us, our world revolves around our kids, which is awesome. Kids are a blessing. But if, if our world revolves around them to the point where it keeps us from following Jesus, man, our priorities are out of whack. And so kids' sports is one of those things where, you know, I'll, I'll interact with people and go, hey, I haven't seen you at church in a while or I haven't seen you at group or, you know, how's your relationship with God doing? I don't even know, man. I'm, I'm running all over town. My kids are in all of these different events, all these different things. I go, how, how, how is your time with Jesus? Man, I don't have time with Jesus. But I'm, I'm, I'm a really good dad. I go, man, we need to follow Jesus. He needs to be the primary pursuit of our lives. Maybe it's a career. 
And again, kids sports is not bad. Kids activities are not bad. Uh, career is not bad. Education, retirement plan, retired life, um, your friends, your lifestyle, they may not be bad, but if they're keeping you from pursuing Jesus, again, you can't stay here and follow Jesus if Jesus is walking that way. And you can't ask him to bless your life. Part of the blessing comes from our obedience to actually follow Jesus. I think some of us, it may be comfort. It may be, God may be calling you to follow him, and that's uncomfortable for you. And so if you're going to respond with obedience, you need to take that step of faith, knowing that, man, if you prioritize your life around Jesus, pursuing him, he is going to change you. And so the question is, am I, are you, are you willing to change your plans to pursue Jesus? Are you willing to make the decision? Are you willing to change your habits, your lifestyle, your rhythms, your routines, your organizational structure of your priorities? Are you willing to change those to follow Jesus? Am I willing to change those things? That's a question you can only answer. I've had to change a lot in my life. I, those of you who know me, I, uh, I'd rather not be up here. This is a huge um, stretch for me. It's outside of my comfort zone. I would rather be in the back, pressing buttons and twisting knobs, serving God that way. But God's call for my life has, has asked me to take a step outside of my comfort in trusting him. So I'm following him. I left a career that would have made us very happy and would have radically supported our family in ways that I always dreamed about when I was a kid. But God called me to follow him. And so in some of those things, I had to walk away from my own dreams, my own uh, ideas of what was best for my life. You know what happened? As I'm growing, God's replacing those things and he's reshaping and rechanging my heart. I didn't even know what I really wanted until God got a hold of my heart and changed it. Now I'm excited. I'm still kind of nervous to be up here, but I'm excited to see God do a work in me and through me. And so for us to follow Jesus is different than it was for these disciples. There's not someone going, hey, there's Jesus, let's go follow him. If there is, I would seriously question if they're, if they're sane or not, right? Because Jesus isn't currently here. And so how do you and I pursue Jesus? How do we do it? One of the ways we pursue Jesus is through his, his word, through the Bible. The Bible is such an amazing, um, amazing book. Why? Because it's alive. Because this tells us who God is, what God has done, it's, it tells us how he leads, how he speaks to his people, how he speaks to you and I. This is full of words, his words, his promises, his encouragement to us, his warnings, his, his, um, his challenges to us. In this, we see his character is being revealed, his heart, his desire for you, for me, his love for you and for me is all on display in this. We need to spend time in his word, reading and learning and, and, and discovering who God is, pursuing him this way. And I know some of us are gonna go, yeah, yeah, but I don't read. Like I can read, but I don't read. I don't wanna read. I'm done with school. I did that for however many years that was, 12 years, I'm done reading. And I, and I would say, man, again, there are other ways to get the word of God. There's these things, uh, the Bible app, you can actually press a button and it'll actually read the Bible to you. It's amazing. Whatever you have to do to get God's word into you, to pursue God and his voice, do it. Well, you don't understand my schedule, Michael. I, I'm super swamped. I got stuff all over. I can't wake up early like you. I don't, I don't work one day a week like you pastors do, you know. Uh, it's true. I only work half a day, really, so it's not even a full day. I'm almost out of here. It's almost 12. I'm done. Um, but I, there, there are opportunities. Again, I shared a couple weeks ago about calendar audits and actually checking what you actually spend your time on. It's pretty surprising. But if you, if you are slammed with stuff, there are times in your car, I'm sure most of us drive to work, um, that you can turn the music off. Uh, it'll probably help you be less aggressive, less frustrated with uh, what you guys call traffic. Um, I don't call this traffic. I'm from Southern California. I know what real traffic is. Uh, but you have time in your car. You can either put the audio Bible on and let God speak to you, um, you know, or you can put on heavy metal and rage and start yelling and cussing at people and saying, hey, I love God too, get out of the way. You know, whatever you wanna do. But there's, there's, there's chances for you to pursue God in the Bible. Another way we can pursue God is through prayer. 
taking time to pray. God is leading us as a church into a new season of, of prayer. Why? Because God hears us and he responds to prayer. For any of us to see this world change, to see maybe our friend who is far from God actually change and come to know Jesus, we know it takes prayer. It needs, we need God moving in us and through us to, to see him working. And so prayer is communication with God. It's spending time with him, sharing with him your, your highs, your lows, your struggles, your concerns, your frustrations. It's okay to come to God and go, God, I'm really frustrated right now. It's okay to have that open dialogue with God. What happens sometimes is we come to God with a laundry list of demands, like we're like terrorists, and we go, hey, here's what I want. I want this, 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 and this, and this, and I'll promise to be good. Amen. You know, it's like, that's not how a relationship works. That's not how pursuing somebody works. If I went to Hannah and said, hey, here's my list of demands. I want this, 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 and this, and this, and I'll promise I'll do better next time. So be it. Amen. I wouldn't have a wife. I wouldn't be in a relationship. And so for us, we need to spend time praying with God and listening, listening to God. Again, sometimes it's just turning off the radio on your commute to let God have space in all of the chaos that we have to create a quiet moment where you can actually hear the voice of God, where you can actually hear him impressing on your heart, encouraging you to love him more, to love those around you. So prayer is such an amazing thing. And for me, one of the tools I use to help my pursuit of Jesus is journaling. Not because I like keeping a diary, um, but because I forget. I will face something this week that is the end of the world for me. And God's like, did you forget? Last week I brought you through something way worse. And so for me, it's, it's helpful to remember where, where God is taking me and where he's growing me. And actually to be able to look back and see throughout the journals going, God, you have done some amazing things in my life, in the lives of those people around me. This is how we pursue Jesus, by remembering what he's already done. So a disciple of Jesus pursues Jesus, and that pursuit, that pursuit is, is personal. It's between you and the Lord. It's also in proximity. You have to get where Jesus is, be close to him. And it's also progressive. I love this picture of progressive, uh, progression that we see in this. We see as Andrew brought Simon, we see Jesus change Simon. He said, your name was Simon. Now your name's gonna be Peter. When you and I pursue Jesus in a personal, intimate way, when we're close with him, we're spending time with him, growing uh, with him, learning who he is and who we are in him, our, we start progressing in our faith. We start growing. God starts changing us. Just like me, I, again, if you were to ask me five years ago, 10 years ago, that I'd be here in this place, I'd say no. Why? Because I honestly thought people were the worst. I was good with my relationship with God and I thought people were the worst. But as I pursue Jesus, he goes, man, your heart is broken. But as you come closer to me, he started healing my heart and he says, I love you. Now go love those around me. God, I, I need you more because the people around me are miserable. They're annoying. They say they're gonna do something and they don't do it. They don't follow through, God. And he goes, have you seen a mirror lately? Like, that is who you are and I still love you. And so God changes our hearts. As you and I grow in our love for God, he starts to increase our love for people, our love for connection. The more we pursue him, the more he changes us. And those desires that we maybe thought were the end all be all, they start getting reshaped by God's purpose, by God's call on our lives. All of us are called to be disciples, not just super Christians. All of us are called to be disciples. A disciple is someone who pursues Jesus. So real life, my question for you is who are you pursuing? Who are you pursuing? Who are you chasing after? Or what are you chasing after? Is it Jesus? Or is it something of your own design or desire? Uh, for us, again, we exist to reach this world for Jesus one person at a time. The only way that we're gonna multiply disciples and churches in real relationship is by an honest pursuit of Jesus, of becoming disciples who are so passionately pursuing after Jesus that he is radically transforming us that we can have the, even the ability to share his love with those around us. 
And so for us as a church, that's who we are. That's what we want to be. And so for, for us, you know, that's why we're launching groups again. Why? Because I need help pursuing Jesus. When I try to do it on my own, I can't. Because I forget, I'll stub my toe, and then this, the whole world is over. I need people to go, Michael, God is good. Keep your eyes on him. Focus on him. Keep pursuing him. I know things are tough right now. We're willing to walk with you. So we need each other. That, they help, people help us in times of, of hardship. They help us keep pursuing Jesus. And as we keep getting closer to Jesus, he changes us, transforms us so that we can be people who reach this world. We can be people who see our family members and friends who are far from God come to say yes to him and know him. So maybe you're in the room today and maybe you are at a place of going, I need a savior. I'm tired of living this life for myself. I'm tired of following after my own, des my own desires. I want to follow Jesus. If that's you today, your first step of response is obedience, is, is to be baptized. Baptism is a beautiful outward display of what God is doing on the inside. Your, your life, your self-led life is dying. It's being buried under the water. And when you come out of the water, you're a new creation, the Bible says. The old is gone, the new has come. And you're one of those baby followers of Jesus, those cute baby followers of Jesus who need help growing in maturity of your faith. And so if that's you today, we have everything you need. We have a team in the back that would love to pray with you. They'd love to give you shorts, shirts, towels, everything to take that step today. Maybe some of us are in the room, we need prayer because our worlds are upside down or maybe our, our priorities are all out of whack and we need someone to come alongside us and encourage us and pray with us and for us. If that's you, we're gonna have people up front that would love to pray with you. For the rest of us, we're gonna worship. So let's stand as we prepare our hearts to, to respond. And this response is not based on your feeling. It's not based on your, your maybe knowledge or intellect. Your, your response is based on who God is. And God is good. He is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. So we're gonna worship him because he is worthy. Maybe not because I feel like it or you feel like it. We're gonna worship him because he is good. And so let me pray. And then after I pray, if you're getting baptized, you'll head to the back. If you need prayer, you'll come forward. Let me pray. Jesus, I thank you so much that you first pursued us, God, that we can even love you because you first loved us. So God, I thank you. And I pray that you'd help us to pursue you with everything we got, God. I pray that you'd reveal those areas in our life that we are holding back from you, that we are not fully trusting you in, God. Those areas where we still think, God, I got this under control. God, reveal those to us, God, and give us courage to surrender those places in our lives to you, that we would be wholeheartedly following after you, not, not staying stuck, hoping and wishing and dreaming we could follow you, but actually taking steps of obedience to follow you, God. I pray that you'd encourage us as, a, as individuals and as a family, God, to rally around each other, to encourage one another. God, that's the greatest, one of the greatest gifts we can do is to encourage one another to follow you. So God, we love you and we honor you, God. We ask that you would do an amazing work in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're getting baptized, head to the back. If you need prayer, come forward. The rest of us, let's worship our King.